Good afternoon, everyone, all the participants in the room, and also good uh, morning, afternoon, or evening uh, for those who, who join online. My name is Chantal Joris. I'm with Freedom of Expression Organization, Article 19, and I will be moderating the session today. Um, in today's session, uh, we want to explore some of the current challenges um, posed to the free flow of information uh, specifically uh, during armed conflicts and I want to start with making a couple of opening remarks as to as to where we are at. Um, we do know that conflict parties have always been very keen uh, to control the narrative and shape the narrative during conflicts uh, perhaps to garner domestic and international support, uh, to maybe portray in a favorable light how the conflict is going for them, and of course also often to cover up human rights violations and violations of international humanitarian law. So uh, this is nothing new, yet what has changed, of course, um, is, is how armed conflicts look like in the, in the internet age. Um, we see an increased use of digital threats against journalists, uh, and human rights defenders, uh, mass surveillance, uh, content blocking, internet shutdowns, and even the way that information is manipulated is, has become much more sophisticated uh, with the tools that, that parties have available today. And of course, at the same time, uh, civilians really rely at an unprecedented level on information communication technologies to keep themselves safe, to know what's going on during the conflict, where fighting takes place, and also to, to be communicating uh, with, with the people, that, um, with their loved ones, and, and see that, that they are okay. Um, and, and also I want to emphasize a little bit that these issues are not necessarily limited to just sort of the top uh, five to ten conflicts that we all, that make that tend to make the headlines, but there are currently um, about 110 uh, active armed conflicts uh, in all regions of the world. And also beyond conflict parties, even states that are not part of the conflict have to grapple with questions. Uh, for example, we've seen recently, uh, should they sanction propagandists, ban foreign media outlets? So this, this is really an issue that uh, concerns uh, every state and uh, all states and the whole world. And also what we, all, what we have seen is that uh, digital companies have become increasingly important actors uh, as well in conflicts, and they do need to find strategies uh, to avoid to become complicit in human rights violations and violations of humanitarian <coughs> laws. Um, so to discuss some of these challenges, um, I'm very happy to introduce uh, the panelists uh, of today. Um, also, I do want to make a, a quick remark in this context that we noticed that many of our partners uh, from uh, conflict regions have not been able to come to IGF in person and have these discussions in person. Although we talk a lot about the need for an open and secure internet, uh, including of course during conflicts, and uh, they are often the stakeholders that are most affected and they're not really able to join uh, these discussions except online. Um, similarly, uh, some, some of our speakers, most of our speakers on this topic uh, that we really wanted to have at the table are, are also joining us online today. Um, the first speaker uh, joining us online is Tetiana Avi, Avdievieva. Uh, she's legal counsel at the Digital Security Lab Ukraine, uh, an organization that has been established to address digital security concerns of human rights defenders and organizations in Ukraine. We also have Kata Hamad, an independent Sudanese researcher focusing on digital rights and internet governance, who is working with the Open Observatory of Network Interference and the Code of Africa. We have Joelle Risk joining us. She is digital risks advisor um, at the protection department of the International Committee of the Red Cross. And next to me here in person is Elena Hickok. Uh, she's managing director of the Global Network Initiative, of which Article 19 is also a member. Um, I will let her also introduce uh, what this uh, multi-stakeholder initiative is all about. Um, also, we were supposed to have here uh, Irene Khan, Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression. Unfortunately, uh, she had to be in New York at the same time 
in person and uh, we were struggling to remove her from the program so apologies for that but uh, she has she has been focusing on these questions as well and i encourage you to read also her report from last year on disinformation in in armed conflicts and and she continues to engage in the in this discussion as well um, so, quick break breakdown of the format of the session. So, we have uh, about uh, 75 minutes to, to discuss these challenges. I will um, address a couple of questions to the speakers, but it is really meant as an interactive discussion. It is meant to be a round table. So, I will also be um, asking some of the questions to you as well, after the speakers uh, have, been, have been able to express themselves on the issues. Um, so through, throughout the discussion, um, and then at the end also there will be there will be a um, chance obviously to to give input also what we might have missed, uh, what open questions there are for the speakers. Um, so perhaps let's start with with discussing sort of the main the main digital risks that we see and also the risks to the free flow of information during conflicts. And I will first have um, our um, uh, Tetiana from Ukraine and Khatab from Sudan uh, talk about this, but then also again I will be very keen uh, to hear from you what uh, in your areas of work or from the regions you're from, what you have been observing as sort of the, 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 key, the key challenges in this respect. So Tetiana, if I can start with you. Yeah, hi everyone. Hi. It's my great pleasure to be here today and to talk about such an important topic. So first of all, I wanted to share like a brief overview of what is going on in Ukraine currently regarding the restrictions on free speech, free flow of information and ideas, which were introduced long before the full-scale invasion, since the war in Ukraine started in 2013 with occupation of Crimea and after the full-scale invasion as a rapid response to the changing circumstances. So basically restrictions in Ukrainian context uh, can be divided into two parts. Uh, the first part concerns the restrictions which are related to the regime of the martial law and derogations from the international obligations. And the second part uh, relates to so-called permanent restrictions. Uh, for example, there is a line of restrictions based on origin, particularly concerning Russian films, Russian music, and other related issues. Uh, also, there are restrictions serving as a kind of follow-up of Article 20, for example, a prohibition of propaganda for war, a prohibition of justifications of illegal aggression, etc. Um, the problem is, especially with the restrictions which were introduced after the full-scale invasion, that restrictions drafted in a rush are often poorly formulated, and therefore there are lots of problems with their practical application. However, what concerns me the most in this discussion is the perception of the restrictions of the kind by international community. Uh, the problem often is that people don't take into account the context of the restrictions. And when I'm speaking of the context, it is not only and purely about missiles flying above like someone's head. It is about the motives which drive people to be involved into the armed conflicts. And that is a very important reservation to be made at the very beginning of this discussion. Because we have to speak about the root causes. And um, I often make this comparison. For me, armed conflicts uh, can be compared uh, to the rules of saving energy. Uh, that armed conflicts do not appear from nowhere and they do not disappear anywhere. So when, for example, a certain situation starts, we have to understand that there are motives behind the aggression uh, on the side of the aggressor. And therefore we have to work with those motives to prevent further escalation and to prevent repetition of the armed conflict, to prevent re-escalation, basically. In this case, assessment of the context is unfortunately not a basic mass. It is rather a rocket science. Because, for example, in Ukrainian context, the preparation of the fertile ground for propaganda for Russian interference has been done in the information space for at least the last 30 years of Ukrainian independence, when 
uh, on the entire European level, it was said that Ukraine is not basically a state and that there is no right to sovereignty and that was basically a gift to Ukrainian nation, uh, that all the representations uh, like in front of international community from the side of the post-Soviet countries were done by Russia, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What does it mean? It means that there was a particular narrative which was developed and narrative with which we have to work. Uh, why this is important? Because uh, usually restrictions are treated, um, I would say rather in vacuum. So we are trying to apply the ordinary human rights standards to the speech, which is, shared, developed, uh, which is to the narrative which is developed in the context of the armed conflict. And it is very important because at the very end of the day, what any country which is in the state of war faces is the statement that as soon as the armed conflict is over, all the restrictions have to be lifted. And here we miss a very important point, the point about the transition period, so-called exit strategy, which is very frequently substantiated by automatic cancellation of the restrictions. And that actually is a part of the discussion on the rebuilding of Ukraine in terms of like re reinforcing the democratic values, reestablishing human rights, which were restricted, etc. So at this particular point, it is very important to mention that uh, we have to think about the transition period of lifting the restrictions from the very beginning of the armed conflict. Because when the restrictions are introduced, we have to understand that they cannot end purely when uh, there is a peace agreement. Otherwise, it won't make any sense from the practical standpoint because narratives will still be there in the air. Therefore, we have to develop this exit strategy and understand that post-war societies are very vulnerable towards any kind of malicious narrative, and they cannot be left without protection even after the end of the war. And finally, a brief overview of the digital security concerns. I will try to summarize it in one minute, not to steal a lot of time. Uh, currently, there are lots of problems from the digital security side. For example, there are attacks on databases, attacks on media, which not only target the media as website for sharing information, but also target the journalists which is more important because people experience chilling effect and they're super afraid of sharing any kind of idea because they potentially might be targeted. Uh, indeed, I mean, from the side of the aggressor state, because currently in Ukraine, at least in Ukrainian context, the biggest threat uh, is stemming from Russia, especially for those journalists who are working on the front line and who can be captured, who can be tortured, who can be killed. And there were lots of examples of such things happening. Also, there is a problem of DDoS attacks on websites, which actually interrupts the work of the websites and disables the sustainable connection. There were attempts to share malware and spyware again in order to track individuals, in order to check what topic they're working on, and in order to prevent the basically the truth to be distributed to the general public. And finally, there are coordinated disinformation campaigns on uh, the social media, on like platforms, messaging services, including Telegram, which is another important topic. And probably this topic is a topic for the separate discussion. So I won't be uh, stopping on that like for uh, my entire speech, but just mention it for you to understand that this discourse is very extensive and there are lots of things to talk about. I will stop here. Uh, I will give floor back to Chantala. Thank you very much for listening to me and we'll be happy to share further ideas in the course of the discussion. Thank you very much, Tatiana. Um, Katap, if I, if I can bring you in and, and have you share also your observations about um, the situation in, in Sudan, also following the recent um, outbreaks uh, of hostilities a, a couple of months ago. Thank you, Chantal. Hi, everyone. Um, so uh, I want to uh, welcome you and the the other participants and it's really an honor for me to speak at the IGF. So um, to keep that in these um, updated, 
um, Sudan is going through um, a war between uh, two forces that have been um, allied since uh, the year of uh, 2013, and the disagreement came to up uh, came to an end on um, to April uh, 15 uh, on on April 15 due to uh, differences in the security agreements related to the unification of the uh, armies in Sudan. So this put uh, the Sudanese in an um, in a position uh, in a bad position due to the uh, parties uh, to due to the uh, parties to the war uh, because um, the parties of the war are not following uh, the laws of war. Um, in addition to uh, its impact on basic services, including um, uh, electricity and communication. So this contributed uh, to um, widespread uh, manipulation of uh, war narrative and uh, uh, the spread of misinformation in addition to the intense uh, polarization. So um, to answer your question, um, in Sudan right now, we have um, uh, internet shutdowns, we have um, um, targeting of telecom workers. We have also uh, disinformation uh, campaigns, and also we have uh, privacy violation. And it's and unfortunately, um, these practices are are used by both sides of uh, of war, not only um, uh, one side like RSF or the rapid support forces, RSF or uh, Sudanese armed forces, the official. Um, uh, military. So uh, regarding internet disruption, um, internet disruption is not um, a new experience for the people in Sudan. Uh, the authorities used to um, to shut down the internet during uh, exams and civil unrest. And this time, due to the ongoing conflict, there were numerous and periodic internet disruptions in Khartoum, the capital of Sudan, and the cities of Niala, Zalinje, and al um, These events are considered as effort of information control during the war. Um, however, some disruption cases in Khartoum are related to security concerns of um, the telecom engineers and other uh, telecom related workers as they may face violence because of their um, movement towards uh, maintenance. Towards, uh, maintenance. So um, the absence of internet connection opened um, a wide door to offline disinformation as people cannot uh, verify um, information that they got from local sources. Um, moreover, um, disinformation during uh, the conflict also exists in cyberspace and it has um, several actors, but there are two main uh, players here. Uh, they are uh, SAF, the Students Armed Forces, and RSF. Um, both parties are using proxy accounts and influencers on social media platforms to promote their, uh, to promote and uh, to propagate their um, their narrative regarding the war. Actually, this practice puts civilians at risk because uh, getting wrong information um, may impact their decision to move around their neighborhood or the decision of displacement. Um, moreover, um, what I observed is that this information is uh, threatening the humanitarian response as, um, so for example, the ICRC office in Sudan posted on Facebook, um, warning the people um, not to follow, um, uh, to not follow uh, this information. So also during this war, um, several privacy violation cases happen, such as uh, physical phone inspection. A, a lot, a lot of, uh, a lot of um, uh, cases of uh, physical phone inspection by uh, by soldiers from both sides, and also the use of spyware. Actually, we couldn't um, verify uh, the use of spyware until now, but there are claims of that. But the important thing here is we have to mention that um, RSF imported the Predator spyware of Intellexa. Um, Intellexa is an uh, EU-based company uh, that is uh, providing uh, uh, intelligence tools. And also 
um, this is not the first time of using uh, spyware in Sudan as, as NISS, the National um, Intelligence and Security Service imported um, the remote control system of uh, the Italian company uh, hacking team in uh, 2020, in, uh, in 2012. So I think that's it uh, from my side, Chantal, back to you. Thank you very much, and thank you also for this account and explaining how how these information threats can also really lead to to offline violence and and concrete uh, harms to civilians. So, um, same question to to the people in the room: uh, what what have you seen, or what have you perceived as being sort of the main in your experience, the main uh, risks to the to the free flow of information, uh, be it through uh, surveillance, propaganda, internet shutdown, what's, what's your perspective? Hi, thank you so much for uh, great presentations. Um, I'm Eliška Birkova from Access Now, um, and we are also working on the issue of content governance in times of crisis. And we have been recently mapping number of prevailing trends in the field that in one way or another put either freedom of expression and other fundamental rights in danger. Um, and we looked specifically uh, at this issue from the perspective of, of international humanitarian law and so we are witnessing several issues, especially parties to the conflicts that are actually uh, very much in instigators of those. One of them is, of course, the intentional spread of disinformation as a part of war way tactic, uh, where we noticed a number of cases that we are now, so we have these different case scenario that we are supporting with the case studies too that really happen in the field such as, for instance, claiming or warning that there will be invasion taking place, and in, in reality, this invasion has never occurred. There is a very specific example from Israel in 2021, um, where even international media were convinced and believed that this invasion take place and reported on it, which was just the part of military strategy. And there are a number of other examples from different regions around the world where we see that. Another one is, of course, using platforms for the purpose of moving the parts of population from one territory to another, which from the perspective of international humanitarian law is not, at least in the context of non-international armed conflict, it's not even permitted. Um, so we see those cases as well. Of course, um, the whole entire issue of the content depicting prisoners of war, uh, that was very largely reported, um, and that can, again, put uh, in danger the privacy of those people, identity, and so and so, uh, so on, so the safety and security of those individuals depicted on that video content that is being shared. And there are maybe other two or three case scenarios that we identified in the field and that we are now still gathering case studies, and this will be all summarized in our upcoming report that we're hoping to publish in following weeks. Uh, I don't want to overcome it. Um, but I'm happy to elaborate further without uh, going much in and give space to others as well. Thank, thank you very much for the, for the excellent points. Um, anyone else? Mm. Ah, yes, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, you hear me? Yeah. Uh, thanks uh, for giving the floor an opportunity to speak and express myself. I'm Tim from Russia. And uh, what I can say about internet shutdowns, internet restrictions in terms of conflict, it's pretty obvious that any country involved in the conflict will ensure that there will be some restrictions on internet, websites, media, and so on. But frankly speaking, it is not so restricted at, as it could be seen from abroad, as long as there are plenty of, like, you, you can't stop information from flowing around through, like, telegram messengers from some social media and stuff. And uh, lots of Ukrainian media and Ukrainian Telegram channels are still and effectively available in Russia. So I can say there is super restricted um, environment in the Russian media sphere. So far, we face lots of, as the same as Ukrainian um, speaker said, we, f we face lots of like uh, cybersecurity threats coming obviously from Ukraine the same way, like denial of service attacks, like some uh, sophisticated attacks on governmental and non-governmental like 
private web services companies, and we have lots of uh, like uh, data leaks. For example, recently, uh, Ukrainian hackers published a leaked database from the company who was a service provider for all the airline tickets and airline connections and stuff. So basically, all the imaginable personal data, including like uh, names, dates, and all the um, flying information of, of uh, Russian people, Russian citizens, was published in the internet, in the telegram, and was available for uh, any malicious actors. And uh, so far, we see a lot of threats and insecurities from um, disinformation campaigns and threats uh, and fakes, which are used as a weapon in an informational war happening aside of real war in between Russia and Ukraine. And uh, it's so sad that this kind of informational war and this kind of weapons and weaponry used in informational war is not described in any international law and is not even somehow imagined and prescribed. Uh, what's, because there is, you know, it's, the situation is like that. There is, um, say, international law for wars, for real wars and for real warfare, but there is no international laws for informational warfare. And both of the countries and uh, both of the like uh, all the citizens of our countries, both Ukraine and Russia, suffer from this internet warfare. Uh, so the situation is like that. So the situation is like that, that uh, both of parties use this kind of uh, weapons uh, in the informational war in between our countries. For example, uh, for this year, uh, working in a like non-profit organization, which, is, uh, which focuses on countering disinformation and fakes in Russia, we have found more over 3,000 uh, disinformational narratives threatening Russian Federation and Russian citizens in some different ways. Uh, this is about like number of narratives, but separately we have counted each like post and message in social media, uh, and the number of messages and posts and reposts placed in social media in overwhelming 10 million copies in the Russian media sphere. Uh, uh, th thank you. I think there will be uh, probably um, quite, quite some disagreement in, in the room and also I will uh, let uh, Tatiana perhaps uh, respond and, and react. Uh, to some of the remarks. Um, certainly, uh, there is an, a gap in international law as to how to deal uh, appropriately with, uh, with information manipulation, actually both in, in times of peace and, and in times of, of armed conflicts. Um, I don't know if we have uh, any, yes. Uh, yeah, just a brief response. First of all, um, I find it particularly interesting when the discussion around the um, incitements to aggression, propaganda for war, and uh, incitements to hatred turns into the discussion uh, around the disinformation campaign spread inside Russia, which for me is slightly a shifting of the context, because when we are speaking of the aggression issues per se, we have to take into account the narratives which are primarily aimed at actually instigating the armed conflict, uh, and also narratives which are shared inside Russia, connected to the, uh, for example, inviting people to join in Russian armed forces, or connected to uh, actually incitements to commit illegal activities, which predominantly are shared on Russian media, especially those which are state-backed. Also, as regards the digital security threats and digital security concerns, uh, what concerns me the most uh, is the attempt to basically um, substitute the uh, actual topic of harming civilians and uh, the topic of uh, basically trying to suppress activists uh, opposition, human rights defenders and journalists uh, by the fact that there are restrictions which affect the entire community in Russia. Uh, 
uh, first and foremost, because among the Russian community itself, there is an extensive support towards the invasion. Uh, even Russian independent media, Medusa, it's in its uh, findings and its research stated that from 70 to 80 percent of Russian citizens actually support the invasion. Uh, when assessing the restrictions in this context, the proportionality analysis, in my opinion, would a little bit differ comparing to the situation when we are just declaring the uh, like facts without providing the appropriate context for them. So I will stop here and I won't probably <laughs> create the bottle out of this discussion here. Uh, but I think that it's a very important topic to clearly define the things we are talking about and to clearly indicate in which context they're done, to whom they're attributable, and what are the uh, specific consequences of the actions which are taken, and what is the reasoning behind those actions which are taken. Thank you. Hello. Yes, uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, as mentioned, when we go to the, the factual scenarios of, of specific conflicts, for sure there can be uh, a lot of disagreements as to as to what specifically the, the issues are. I will take uh, one more contribution, and then uh, I will I will um, and then let's hear from the from Joel Risk from the ICRC. Uh, hi, I'm Rafik from Internews here. Uh, yeah, just this may be more of a niche issue potentially, but um, one of the biggest frustrations that we hear from our um, media and journalist partners particularly, uh, though also from civil society, is around uh, over-enforcement from social media platforms um, where uh, legitimate news reporting um, or commentary on conflict is uh, taken down um, and uh, le legitimate news sources uh, uh, have, have their accounts suspended um, or restricted from amplifying or boosting content. Um, sometimes it's through uh, automation in cases like uh, Palestine or Afghanistan where you, you can't report on the news without um, mentioning dangerous organisations. Um, uh, we find a lot of media outlets wind up getting their pages restricted. Um, uh, and then other times it's through... Um, you know, mass reporting and kind of targeting of, of these news sources um, that result in uh, incorrect, you know, having having their pages taken down. Uh, sometimes people do actually violate the, the rules of the platform too, uh, maybe, you know, posting pictures of, of, uh, of um, dead bodies and things like that that, um, you know, that do violate the rules, but there's, in a conflict setting, it's, it's often complicated. Um, so yeah, just in terms of the free flow of information, that's that's another issue. Um, thank you. Yes, uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, also promoting a certain narrative or or sharing violations um, for propaganda purposes, for example, is obviously something very different than reporting on them to make them um, publicly known, but uh, given how often automated tools are also involved in content moderation, uh, it's, it's very difficult to to make that distinction uh, uh, properly. Um, Joel, let me let me turn to you and perhaps ask you as well, hearing from, from the situation in, in Ukraine and Sudan, um, does that, um, is that also what the, the sort of threats that you that you have perceived uh, globally as a humanitarian organization and, and what sort of specific risks um, has the ICRC identified in terms of how these digital threats can harm civilians? Thank you, Shankar, and, and thank you also for interesting uh, contributions they made for Ukraine uh, Sudan. I will maybe focus a little bit more on the harms to civilians you asked, um, rather than on the nature of the uh, of, of the threats. So, because of course our concern is not only about the use of digital technology, but also about the lack of access to to, to that, especially to connectivity, particularly when people need reliable information the most to make potentially life-saving uh, decisions. The we see that the information dimension of conflict has also become. Jo Joel. Uh, 
I'm, I'm yes. so sorry. We have a little bit of you're breaking up a little bit. I don't know if there's anything. Uh, I don't know if it's the connection or if there's anything you can do with the with the mic that will make it a little bit clearer. Let me change the mic setting. Um, is it better like that? Okay. Yes, much better. So I see you nodding. Oh, okay. All right, great. Thank you. Sorry, I, it was a mic setting, I believe. Um, so I was saying that the information dimension of conflict have also become part of, in a way, of digital front lines, um, because digital platforms are used to amplify um, a spread uh, of, of harmful information at a wider scale, reach and speed than, than we've ever seen before. And then that is a concern because it compromises people's safety, their rights, uh, their ability to access also these rights and their and their dignity. And this the difficulty is that this happens in various ways that are very difficult uh, to prove. Um, Tatiana spoke of attribution a little bit. It is very difficult indeed to even not only to 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 do that, but also to prove how. Um, harmful information is actually causing harm to civilians affected by conflict. And I'll try to speak about that a little bit. Um, we see that different actors, whether they are state or non-state, are leveraging the information space to achieve information advantage, as you, you had said earlier, Chantal, but also to shape uh, public opinion, shape the, the dominant narrative, and that also to influence people's beliefs, their interests, and their, their behaviors. Uh, which is where in situations of conflict, it really becomes an issue of risk, um, potentially to other uh, civilians. Um, the information space in that sense is an extension of the conflict domain. And it impacts people that are already in a vulnerable situation because they're already affected by conflict. And with the digitalization of communication system, then it becomes basically a convergent of the information and digital domains. That being said, not all harmful information and distorted information, whether it's misinformation, disinformation, um, malinformation and hateful and offensive speech, not all of it is a result of organized information operations, right? Not all of it is state sponsored, uh, but the use of digital platforms really uh, have, has a mix of state and non-state actors and between organized uh, spread of narratives, but also an organic spread of uh, information and harmful information. What we've seen in the past years, um, and maybe also just to caveat on that, that makes it very complex from a humanitarian angle, again, to identify, to, to detect that, that it is a harmful narrative, but also to assess uh, um, what is the harm to that. Um, to the civilians and then to think of an adequate response, given the, all of these complexities that I just uh, mentioned. And what I've seen in the past years is that how countries affected by armed conflict um, and in these countries, the spread of misinformation and disinformation and also uh, hateful and offensive speech can already aggravate tensions uh, and can intensify conflict dynamics, um, which of course will have a very important toll on civilian population. For example, uh, harmful information can increase pre-existing social tensions, pre-existing grievances. It can also even you know, take advantage of pre-existing grievances to escalate social tensions and exacerbate polarization, violence, um, all the way to a point where it's a disintegration of uh, social cohesion. Uh, information narratives can also encourage acts of violence against people uh, or encourage other violations of uh, humanitarian law. And, and you already mentioned quite a few uh, examples. Uh, uh, Alishka also mentioned a couple of examples. Uh, the spread of misinformation and disinformation can increase vulnerabilities to those affected by conflict. The distress, the psychological weight it can cause, or which is often invisible. Um, for example, Think of how harmful information may feed anxiety and fear and also mental suffering of people that are already under significant distress. Uh, we fear that the spread of harmful information can also trigger threats, harassments, which may lead to displacement and evictions. And I think a couple of examples were already given in, in the room. Uh, we also worry about stigmatization uh, and, and of discrimination. Think of survivors, uh, for example, of, of sexual violence. Think of uh, uh, families that uh, are, are, are thought about as belonging to one or the other of a group or one or the other, uh, an ethnic group, for example, where they may be stigmatized. 
uh, about people being denied access to essential services as a result as well, um, only because they belong to a group that is subject to uh, an information campaign or, or, or a narrative. Um, we also fear that distorted information in times of emergencies uh, and people's ability to access potentially life-saving information is heavily compromised today. Um, and people may not be able to judge what information they can trust at what time, uh, when at a time when they really need uh, accurate and timely information for their safety and for their protection. For example, to understand what is happening around them, where danger and risks may be coming from, uh, roads that are open or not, safe or not, locations of checkpoints, etc., and how and where they may find uh, assistance, in, whether it's medical or other type of assistance, uh, or take measures and make timely decisions um, to protect themselves or to even search for help. So uh, the digital information space can also become a space where behavior that are counter to international humanitarian law may occur, including, and I will not give you know, contextual examples, including the incitement to uh, targeting of civilians, to killing civilians, uh, making threats of violence that may uh, be considered as terrorizing the civilian population, uh, but also information campaigns, whether they are online or offline, and, and I would like to underscore online and offline, uh, can also disrupt uh, and undermine humanitarian operations. Uh, Hattab spoke a bit about that, but um, I want to say that when this happens, when uh, undermining humanitarian operations may also hinder the ability to provide uh, these humanitarian services to people that are most in need for it, and of course also compromise safety of humanitarian uh, aid workers. One last point I'd make on this is that even the approaches that are adopted to address this phenomenon in, in themselves, uh, and Chantal, you mentioned that uh, in the beginning, may also in, uh, intentionally or not impact people's access to information. Um, they may fuel uh, crackdown, uh, more surveillance, more tracking of people, um, crackdown on freedoms, on media and journalists, and of course also on political dissent and potentially also on, on minorities. Um, so as a humanitarian as a humanitarian actor, we, we believe that this is an issue that requires a bit of a specific attention, not only because of the implication it has on people's lives, their safety and, and their dignity, but also because of how complex the environment is. And from that angle, a conflict sensitive approach will be necessary. We're used to discussing a lot uh, and the impact of disinformation, for example, from a point of view of public health campaigns, election campaigns, freedom of speech, etc. But when it comes to conflict, a conflict sensitive approach will be necessary. So in other words, uh, an approach that really uh, helps us ask how to best assess the potential harm uh, in the information dimension of conflict and also how that may have impact on civilians that are already affected by several other types of risks, um, mostly offline. Um, and of course, think of adequate responses that will not cause additional harm or amplify um, um, harmful information, whatever it, it, the type of that information will be. And happy, of course, to talk a little bit more um, about that and how it connects to other risks later in, um, in the hour. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Joel. Um, I, I do find this point very interesting about, uh, as a freedom of expression organization, uh, we look at uh, something like this information, obviously through the lens of the human rights framework and, and the test to apply to restrict freedom of expression. But it's interesting to think about it from, from the perspective, again, of, of the potential harm, uh, what are the adequate responses and whether they are the same as the ones we would identify normally as a freedom of expression organization as the adequate responses to, to this information that do not have any unintended negative consequences. Um, with that, let me uh, move to Elonai. Um, so uh, I know that uh, some GNI members um, are uh, obviously telecommunication and internet uh, service providers or also hosting platforms. Um, so I'm just uh, curious to hear like what discussions have you had uh, at the GNI specific to two conflicts and perhaps can you talk a bit about what pressures have companies reported to be facing um, if they operate in these conflicts from, from the conflict parties? 
Yeah, sure. Thanks, Chantal, and um, thanks for the opportunity to be on this panel. Um, maybe to start, just to say GNI is a multi-stakeholder platform working towards responsible decision making in the ICT sector with respect to government mandates um, for access to user information and removal of content. We bring together companies, civil society, academics, and investors. And all of our members commit to the GNI principles on freedom of expression and privacy, and our company members are assessed against these principles um, in terms of how they are implementing them in their policies and their processes and their actions. Um, and we also do a lot of learning work and, and policy advocacy. And so as part of our, some of our learning work, we started a working group um, on the laws of armed conflict to examine responsible decision making during times of conflict um, and the challenges that many of our member companies were, were facing. Um, and then we are also holding a learning series organized by um, GNI, ICRC, and CIPRI, um, which is meant to be and enable an honest conversation around the ways that ICT companies um, can have impact and be impacted in the context of armed conflict. And that's really, you know, to say that I'm, I'm coming to this conversation as GNI not really being or not necessarily being an, an expert in IHL or working in times of armed conflict, but we are trying to bring together the right experts ask the right questions and have the conversations um, that are necessary to help companies um, and other stakeholders nav navigate these really complicated situations. Um, so I think to answer your question, Chantel, <clears throat> as we've heard from a, a number of our speakers today, armed conflicts are really complex um, and there is a lot at stake. Technology companies may offer services that support critical functions, um, provide critical information for citizens, but they can also be used to directly or indirectly facilitate violence, spread false information, potentially prolong and exasperate conflicts. Um, and that's just a few of the potential impacts. There are a number of different risks that companies may need to navigate during times of conflict, and they often have to take difficult decisions um, that require the balancing of a number of stakeholder interests. This includes risks to people, individual users, journalists, vulnerable communities, societies. Um, as well as navigating risks to a company, including its infrastructure, services, equipment, but probably most importantly, their personnel, and especially for telecom companies who have offices on the ground. Um, often their personnel are at risk. Um, and I think companies may need to navigate a whole range of questions about if they operate in a context and what that impact might be. I don't think it's a clear-cut answer. Um, they, on one hand, may be providing access uh, to critical information. They might be a more rights-respecting alternative, um, but they also might be used to facilitate the violence. Um, they have to make, navigate questions about how they operate and function during times of conflicts, including how they're responding to government demands. Um, these can take many different forms, including requests for access to user information, giving access to networks for surveillance purposes, shutting down the networks, carrying messages on networks, removing content, and more. Um, I think that we've seen that these demands may be informal. The legal basis for the demand may be unclear. The duration of the measure being required may not be specified. For example, it might not be clear when a network shutdown should be ended. <clears throat> the scope of the demand may be extremely broad. And I think something that was said by another speaker that's important is that um, these demands can come from both sides of a conflict and not, not just one government. Um, and so I think as companies manage risks to people and their, and their company, their ability to respond to government mandates um, in other ways that might be available to them during times of peace can be really limited. Um, for example, during a time of peace, you could say a company should request clarity of the legality of the request and communicate with the government to determine exact requirements. Um, they should be responding in a way that is minimal, refuse to comply, partially comply, or challenge the request through legal challenge, channel, channels, <clears throat> disclose information about receiving the request to the public or notify the user, um, maintain a grievance mechanism um, when the privacy and freedom of expression of users is impacted by complying with the, with the request. But I think in times of conflict, as 
you know, they face these different risks that they have to manage, it can be really difficult uh, for them to undertake these measures. Um, and I think just from discussions that we've heard, things that are useful include companies having risk management frameworks in place, um, clear escalation channels, clear thresholds to understand what triggers different actions, um, working with other actors to understand the legality of requests, working with other companies to coordinate actions in a specific context, um, and importantly, engaging with experts, including to understand the implications um, of different decisions, and ensuring formal and constant review of decisions on how to improve um, their actions going forward. And I think another challenge that we've heard in our discussions is that it can also be challenging to understand um, when to pull back or to, to de-escalate uh, different measures that are in place um, because it's, it's not always clear when a, a conflict ends. Um, so. Thank you very much, and I do also really uh, support in in these contexts the, the necessity of a multi-stakeholder approach because perhaps, uh, say, the ICRC might not be an expert uh, classically with content moderation, or maybe not yet, maybe that's still to come. Uh, ISP providers are not necessarily experts in conflict settings. Um, they don't they maybe understand, both of them maybe don't understand the typical threats around this information. So I, I do think it's extremely important that, that the different actors um, work together. Um, let me go back to, to Tatiana, maybe focus this sort of second uh, half of the discussion a bit more on trying to identify gaps where we need more clarity and, and also um, have Tatiana and Katab speak to the role of ICT companies uh, specifically in, in the context of, of their conflict. Tatiana, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. And I particularly liked how the discussion is currently going. Um, I mean, what I wanted to briefly follow up and maybe start the discussion around how the ICT companies, how platforms generally have to respond, is that we have to make the clear distinction when organic spread of harmful information uh, turns into spread of actually illegal content. And uh, probably this line has to be specifically identified uh, for the context of armed conflict where the effect of the organic harmful information is amplified by the very context in which it is put. Uh, as regards the ICT platforms, for me, for since like in Ukraine, there is no actually uh, mechani actual mechanism to engage with the platforms on the state level uh, in terms of we do not have jurisdiction over most of tech giants. And that creates the biggest problem because there is no opportunity to uh, communicate with the platforms otherwise. Uh, except for the voluntary cooperation from their side. Uh, that is probably the biggest challenge we have, we as international community have to resolve. Because usually states which face armed conflicts or which face civil unrest, and we can expand this context even like to other emergency situations, they do not have the legal mechanisms to communicate with the platforms. And that is the primary stage for the discussion. Namely, we have to understand when companies have to respond to the governmental requests. To governmental requests of which governments the companies have to respond, especially when there is suspicion or when we actually know that the government, for example, is authoritarian one. When the government has, and the state generally has, the very high index of human rights breaches. Whether the companies have to be involved into the discussions with such governments, with such states at all. So that is the primary point probably we have to think about. Uh, the second thing is um, to what extent uh, IHL and IHRL uh, have to collaborate when we are speaking about the activities of the ICT. For example, and I can share the link in the chat, uh, um, our organization, Digital Security Lab Ukraine, has done an extensive research on disinformation, propaganda for war, uh, 
international humanitarian law, international criminal law, and international human rights law. There is a big discourse about what are the definitions, which legal regime is applicable, and how the states generally and international community have to react when this kind of speech is delivered. With companies, it is even more difficult, just because for them, uh, they're rather, and I, I mean, I can absolutely understand why it happens. They're rather waiting for international organizations. For example, the UNESCO, the OSCE, the Council of Europe to say whether well, there is an incitement to genocide, whether the threshold is reached or not. And that is actually point, like, it's a big plus hundred to multi-stakeholder collaboration. Because there are certain actors which are empowered, which are put in place to say, to call particular legal phenomena by its own name. And we have to understand that, like, I mean, I wish I could say that there are incitements to genocide in what Russia does in Ukraine. But unfortunately, domestic NGOs won't probably be the most reliable source and the most trustworthy source in this case. So that's the uh, point in time when uh, international organizations have to step in. I mean, both international intergovernmental organizations, international NGOs who can elaborate on those issues. And that might be a potential solution how ICT companies might deal with the prohibited types of content. The prohibited kinds of behavior, which is usually called coordinated innocent behavior online. So most probably they need assistance on the more global level, as well as assistance on the local level in order to better understand the context. For example, when we are speaking about the slur words, most probably it is more reasonable to resort to the assistance of the local partners. Uh, and finally, it is about the issue of enforcement. And here, um, my main point at any discussion is that we are usually trying to, unfortunately, we are trying to blame and shame companies which are already good phase one. For example, we are constantly pushing Meta to do even more and more and more. And it is nice that Meta is open to a discussion. But on the other hand, we have such companies as Telegram, as TikTok, which are more or less reluctant to cooperate, or in case of Telegram, they're absolutely closed for cooperation with uh, either a government or civil society. And we also have to solve this issue in particular, because there is a big problem of people migrating from the safe spaces which are moderated but have certain gaps in moderation to the spaces which are absolutely unmoderated just because people feel over-censored in the moderated spaces. And this over-censorship is often caused by our blaming and shaming strategy. Uh, and the very same approach has actually been seen when Meta, for example, was blamed by the increased moderation efforts in Ukraine. I mean, it is good that like the ICT companies finally started to do something. And our main task is not to blame and shame them for not doing the same in other regions, but rather to encourage them to apply the very same approach in all the other emergency situations, to develop crisis protocols, to think about uh, the to initiate basically discussions about IHL and IHRL perspectives, to say like publicly, what kind of problems they face, probably to launch the public calls for cooperation when local NGOs can apply, when local NGOs can themselves engage with content moderation teams, policy teams, oversight teams in case the ICT company has any. So that's my main point probably to all the actors involved that uh, when we see the pattern of the good behavioral pattern on the on behalf of the ICT company, we have to encourage them to expand this good behavioral pattern to other contexts, rather than to shame them that they acted in this way only in one situation. Um, thank you very much. And uh, I, I do echo the calls on companies to take all situations of conflicts uh, equally serious and not focus on the ones uh, more that uh, tend to make headlines or, or where there's 
bigger geopolitical pressures behind. Um, so uh, also over to Katab, then I have uh, two last questions for Elonai and uh, Joel. Um, if you can keep your interventions relatively short, so we have a couple of minutes also for uh, any questions for the audience, that would be appreciated. Katab, over to you. Thank you, Chantal, and thank you, Tatiana, for the great um, intervention. Um, so uh, I will start with the challenges um, that uh, the ICT companies uh, face during the conflict uh, in Sudan, to be specific. So um, the major challenge that the ICT companies are facing in Sudan during uh, the war is electricity, to be honest. Um, before the war, the national grid of electricity was only providing 40% um, of the citizens with power. And after the war, it's clear that um, there was uh, a huge shortage in, in power supply. And this impacted um, the network stability. The, the network, um, by network, I mean um, the, net, the telecom network, not uh, the power network. And um, the data center's availability, which affected the e-banking service in Sudan and other um, uh, basic governmental services. Um, However, the ICT companies normalized uh, with the power um, shortage by equipping the devices, uh, stations, and data centers with uh, uninterruptible um, power supply, uh, as well as uh, UPS, and power generators. But due to the circumstances of the war, as I mentioned earlier, the companies um, could not uh, deliver the fuel to the power generators because of security concerns of the workers. Um, so this led uh, a company like MTN Sudan. MTN Sudan is it's, uh, an ISP in Sudan. Uh, it led uh, MTN to, to announce that they had a service failure due to the disability uh, of delivering the power fuel. And uh, uh, I will transit to um, the role of social media platforms in the ongoing conflict. So um, social media platforms, actually they played a major role in ousting the National Congress Party uh, uh, of Sudan, which was ruling Sudan for 30 years. And also it assist, assisted us in our uh, pro-democracy um, movement. Um, but however, um, these platforms are the main tools of opinion manipulation during uh, the ongoing conflict as um, both conflict parties are using um, the platforms, these platforms to promote their narrative uh, of the war. Um, however, the new um, event here is that uh, there is um, a foreign um, actor, which is um, playing uh, a major role in um, in the uh, cyberspace uh, in Sudan, which is Meta. Um, Meta took down the official and other related um, uh, accounts of private support forces, um, and they they justified that uh, by saying uh, RSF uh, is considered a, a dangerous um, organization, according to the Middle East Eye website. And yes, I confirm that RSF is um, a dangerous organization and uh, we know uh, it's human rights record and how it's bad, but this step from Meta contributed to the efforts, uh, like uh, it's indirectly contributed to the efforts of, of staff to control um, the information and the narrative of war as now there is only um, one way of information. You can get information from SAF while uh, RSF is suppressed. Um, my concern is that, um, yeah, uh, both sides are, are bad, but uh, like, um, like uh, making like um, a free uh, environment of information and then people can can get uh, the information that they want and they can filter uh, by themselves, not taking uh, decisions uh, that uh, contribute indirectly to the uh, to prolonging the war and also uh, 
like assisting in the process of of uh, polarization. So taking a decision without considering the local context is a big mistake. As um, my cons I also have another concern as um, RSF itself was a part of of SAF uh, as SAF founded uh, RSF in 2013. So uh, like it makes sense that both are uh, dangerous organizations. How can you? Uh, the, um, take down uh, one organization and leave the other. Um, also, um, the decision impacted the free flow of information. So, for example, um, fact checkers cannot find information to provide uh, a verification uh, to the claims, as uh, there is no, uh, there is one way of information. Um, and it also has uh, like a security uh, impact on on the on the people on ground. So um, there are some gaps that uh, I want to raise, and I think uh, it should be filled. So in this era, um, the right to access information is related to cyberspace. So um, the front line, uh, the frontliners of accessing the information. Um, are uh, the telecom workers, the telecom engineers, and other um, uh, telecom-related um, uh, workers. So, um, because they are uh, the people who provide and operate uh, the inf infrastructure, which allows us to access information. Um, those workers should be considered by the international um, law to be uh, extraordinarily uh, protected like doctors, journalists, and uh, the human rights defenders. Uh, moreover, in Sudan, we need um, more uh, more training for our people because, um, unfortunately, we don't have um, enough uh, human resources to grow our internet governance, and the knowledge is limited to specific people. And unfortunately, the people are using uh, their uh, their knowledge to um, to restrict uh, the 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 free flow of information and freedom of expression. And also we have to, to, to amend our laws, um, like uh, the Right to Access uh, Act, the Cyber Crimes Law, and the law of uh, national security, as they were uh, being abused using vague terms by the same people who have this knowledge. So um, I think that's it from my side, uh, Chantal and others. Back to you, Chantal. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think, uh, yeah, it's interesting. We've heard now twice of these uh, complications around ICT companies potentially sort of de facto asked to choose sides uh, between the parties to a conflict, also like uh, Ellen and I mentioned earlier. And also, I think, very interesting point about um, the, the key importance of the staff that is in charge of, of keeping these ICT systems going and, and perhaps them needing uh, even specific protections to be able to do that. Um, Elon, uh, so the, the GNI uh, does refer to the principles on um, the guiding principles on, on business and human rights, um, which, which are key also to the GNI principles as to how companies should respect uh, human rights. Uh, they only make very uh, brief reference to humanitarian law, so maybe just a, a, an open question as to, do you feel that there is a sense from companies uh, that they need more guidance as to what it means for them to respect uh, humanitarian law in addition to human rights? Um, I mean, yes, I think that is very central to a number of conversations um, that happen at GNI. I, I guess I would say, so many technology companies approach risk identification um, and mitigation through the lens of business and human rights, and this includes relying on frameworks such as the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises um, and in the UN guiding principles like you just mentioned. Um, and I, I wanted to highlight that there are a couple of rele relevant principles um, as, and parts of the commentary of the UN GPs for companies and states um, with respect to operation in conflict affected areas. Um, importantly, according to the UNGPs, a core principle of the corporate responsibility to respect human rights is that in situations of armed conflict, companies should respect the standards of human, international humanitarian law. And then also the UNGP state that when operating in areas of arm, armed conflict, um, business should conduct enhanced due diligence 
resulting from potentially heightened risk and negative human rights impacts. And there's emerging guidance from civil society organi organizations on how companies can undertake uh, this EHRDD through a conflict lens. Um, I think IHL can help, com help inform tech companies operating in situations of armed conflict about the risks they might expose themselves, their personnel, as well as other people too. Um, but like you mentioned, I think that more guidance is needed as to how due diligence processes can incorporate IHL, as well as more work can be done on the articulation as to what IHL means for ICT companies. Thank you very much. Um, Joël, as the main guardian of IHL, um, I know the ICRC is, is looking into some of these also legal and policy challenges um, uh, that have arisen through these cyber threats. Um, and, and can you talk a bit about this global advisory board which has supported the ICRC in, in addressing some of those? Can you perhaps uh, share some of the initial findings? Uh, of course. Um, would you like me to focus more on ICT companies since that's where the discussion went? Uh, yes, yes, sure. Okay. Um, so yeah, thanks. It's a, it's a good question, Chantal. Um, the, the ICRC has uh, set up a sort of a global advisory board uh, about two and a half years ago. So between 2021 and 2023, uh, we brought together at uh, a high level, really at senior level, advising uh, the president and the leadership of the ICRC on uh, basically experts from legal, military, policy, uh, tech companies, and also security fields to advise on um, the emerging digital threats and new digital threats, and to help us improve uh, our preparedness to engage on these issues, not only with bodies to armed conflict, but also with uh, new actors that we see are very important play a very important role in conflict situations, uh, including, uh, of course, civil society, but also uh, uh, tech companies. So for these, throughout these two years, we've hosted about uh, four different consultations with the advisory board. And hopefully next week on October 19th, we will publish the list of discussions and recommendations. Uh, they're not ICRC recommendations. They won't be ICRC recommendations, but they will be the advisory board uh, recommendations. Um, on digital threats to civilians affected by armed conflict. Uh, so I will maybe broadly mention the four different trends that were discussed in these consultations between the Global Advisory Board and the ICRC. And then I will focus a little bit on the recommendations linked to uh, the information space and then to ICT companies. And I'll, I'll try to be quick because I am aware um, of time. So the first trend that was discussed uh, between the ICRC and the Global Advisory Board is the harm that cyber operations have on civilians during armed conflict. Um, so focusing again on uh, the, uh, the emerging behavior of uh, parties to armed conflict in the cyber space, but also other actors in that space uh, by disrupting infrastructure, services, and data that may be um, essential to functioning of society, but also to human safety. Um, and there we consider that there's a real risk that cyber on, uh, operations will uh, indiscriminately affect uh, widely used computer systems that are connecting um, and connected civilians and civilian infrastructure, but in a way that goes beyond uh, beyond conflict. So as a result, it may interrupt access to essential services, but also hinder the delivery of uh, humanitarian aid um, and cause, of course, um, uh, offline uh, harm and injury and even death uh, to civilians. The other issue that, or the trend that was discussed, it's, is the question of connecti that, that we are discussing today, and that is uh, connectivity and the uh, digitalization of communication systems and the spread of uh, harmful information. And similar to what we uh, already discussed at length uh, in, this, uh, in this session, uh, recognizing that um, information operations have always been part and parcel of conflict, but the digitalization of communication systems and platform is amplifying uh, the scale, reach, and speed uh, for the spread of harmful information. And that, of course, leading to uh, distortion of facts, influencing people's beliefs and behaviors, and raising tensions, and all what we have already discussed, but really stressing that uh, uh, the, the consequences of this is online as well as offline. Uh, the third issue discussed, and, and, and this is really an issue that we hold very close to heart, 
uh, as the ICRC, and that is the blurring of lines between what is civilian and what is military in the digital uh, dimensions of conflict. Um, and, and seeing that civilians and civilian infrastructure becoming more uh, targets of attacks in that space, uh, in the digital dimension of conflict. Um, and of course, uh, this is an issue that is a growing concern as digital front lines are really expanding um, in, uh, and, and they're expanding also, uh, let's say, conflict domains. Uh, the closer that digital technologies move civilians to hostilities, the greater the risk uh, of harm to them, and the more digital infrastructures or services are shared between civilians and military, the greater the risk uh, of civilian infrastructure being attacked. And of course, as a, as a consequence to that, a harm to civilians, but also undermining the very premise for the principle of distinction between uh, civilians uh, and uh, military objectives. And finally, uh, um, of course, not, not by any way the least important, uh, and the fourth issue, uh, very important to uh, us as a humanitarian actor and to all humanitarian organizations, is the way in which in the cyber domain, uh, cyber operations, data breaches, and also information campaigns are undermining the very uh, trust that people and societies are putting in humanitarian organizations. And as a result, the ability to provide uh, life-saving uh, services to, uh, to, to people. So, um, some of the recommend, of course, the, the board had 25 recommendations. I will, of course, not go through them now, uh, but we'll, we'll invite you to, to have a look and, and, uh, and, and read that report on, that will be launched on October 19th. I think it's, it's really a, a beginning of, a of an important conversation between multiple uh, stakeholders in that field. I will maybe speak a little bit on the recommendations uh, in relation to uh, information um, to the spread of harmful information. And maybe uh, um, after listening now to you, uh, I, I will also add a few on recommendations specific to ICT companies. Um, so of course, in addition to uh, recommend, uh, recommendations on a party to respect their international legal obligations, but also assess uh, the potential harm that their action um, and policies are are, are are causing to civilians and may taking measures to mitigate or prevent that. This is, of course, a broad recommendation, but more specifically, um, a recommendation to states uh, to build resilience and, and societies to build uh, resilience against uh, harmful information uh, in ways that uphold the right to freedom of expression, protect journalists, um, and really uh, improve the resilience of societies. And, and by a resilience approach, we of course understand that this is a multiple stakeholder approach that also involves civil society and uh, companies alike. So thinking about it as a 360 degree approach to, um, to addressing the information disorder. Um, another recommendation to the platforms is uh, recognizing the fact that a lot of this uh, misinformation, disinformation is spreading through social media and digital platforms and calling on them to take additional uh, measures to detect signals, analyze sources, analyze methods of distribution, um, different types of harmful information in contextual approaches uh, to managing that um, and, and uh, analyzing what may exist on their own uh, platforms uh, in, in this context, uh, but particularly in relation to situations of uh, armed conflict. And I think Khattab, Khattab's example is a, is a classic example of the importance of contextualizing these policies um, and that these policies and procedures, uh, including when it comes to contact moderation, uh, as Khattab mentioned, should also really align with uh, humanitarian law and human rights standards uh, that Shantag, you also, um, you also have mentioned. Um, and of course, lastly on that, is a recommendation to us and to humanitarian organizations at large to strive to detect signals of the spread of harmful information, but also assess their impact on people. Uh, and that keeping in mind that any responses to harmful information does not or must not uh, amplify uh, harmful information in itself or cause additional or other uh, unintended harm. Um, uh, and of course, a call to contribute to, again, the resilience building of affected people in conflict uh, settings. If I still have a couple of minutes, I'll maybe just uh, 
mention some of the recommendations to ICT companies that are at large and more in, linked to uh, cyber domain and not necessarily to information operations or uh, harmful information. And some of these um, some of these recommendations include um, uh, the segmentation of data and communication infrastructure uh, between what is uh, what is providing military uh, purposes and those that are used uh, by civilians. So the segmentation of uh, communication infrastructure where possible. Um, also awareness uh, of risk uh, uh, for companies uh, and awareness of the legal consequences around their role and their action and the support they may provide to military operations um, and, uh, and, and private clients as well. And that um, uh, awareness of uh, the consequences that their involvement and the use of their products and services in situations of uh, conflict may have. Um, also ensuring that uh, restrictive measures that may be taken in situations of conflict, uh, sanctions or others uh, related to sanctions or other or self uh, uh, limitations as well, do not impede the functioning and maintenance of uh, medical services and humanitarian activities and of course the flow of essential services uh, to the needs of civilian population. Um, I'll stop here. Um, thank you Chantal for giving me the opportunity to, uh, to elaborate on that. Thank you very much. Um, I know we're basically out of time, but I do want to, before we get kicked out, uh, see if anyone has um, something they would like to add, uh, something that you think has been missing from the discussions and should be taken uh, into account by, by the people working on this, uh, or questions, of course, also to the speakers, if they can stick around for five more minutes. Yes, um, thank you. My name is Julia. I work for German Development Corporation, and I would have one question. Um, yesterday morning, Maria Risa said we need more upstream solutions for this information topic, um, and we heard a lot now about more downstream solutions, so content management, taking down certain profiles, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So my question would be: um, What are your views about questions of uh, design of platform so why do we talk how do we talk about redesigning algorithms uh, business models etc and what your perspectives are on these aspects thank you I mean, I, I would just say that I think it's it's really important that companies start to build in the capacity to apply a conflict lens to the development of their products um, and I know that ICRC, for example, is working on, on building um, and working with companies to build out this capacity. So I think we have to consider both upstream and downstream solutions. Katab, uh, Joel, Tatiana, do you want to come in on this question quickly? Um. I will just say very, very briefly, it is in line with uh, a 360 degree approach, of course, that involves um, n n not, I mean, in the upstream thinking that the very business model uh, is reinforcing in a way, um, the way that these policies can be enforced. So from that angle, um, I would tend to, of course, agree, but realistically, um, I think this, this would be a very challenging uh, discussion that also requires expertise that may not be uh, in the hands of those that are currently conducting that feedback loop with uh, with the tech companies. Thank you very much. Um, I, I will perhaps see if there's uh, any other uh, quick questions in the room. Yes, go on. Hi, I'll be super quick. Lindsay Anderson from BSR. For those who don't know, we help companies implement the UNGPs and, and conduct human rights due diligence. And I just wanted to flag a resource that might be useful for folks on this topic. Um, about a year ago, we published a toolkit for companies uh, on how to conduct enhanced human rights due diligence in conflict settings, um, which we developed alongside Just Peace Labs, another organization. Um, and it's very detailed, obviously targeted to companies, but it might be useful for those who are advocating with companies who want to understand um, under the UNGP specifically what they should be doing and, and what um, enhanced human rights due diligence looks like in practice. So if you Google BSR, conflict sensitive due diligence, you'll find that resource. Hi, I'm Farzan Ebadi. Uh, kind of, uh, so I'm working on a project uh, related to US USAID, and they are looking at 
uh, human-centered approaches to digital transformation. And they want to know and understand what, how it can look like and how can they, uh, they can actually engage with the local communities when they are doing this actual digital transformation work. And some and um, one part of that is dealing with a uh, crisis. But uh, the challenges that we see in uh, human-centered approaches and human rights analysis and, uh, is that, in, especially in countries uh, that are in war zones, uh, getting in touch with the communities and uh, receiving their feedback and have that kind of like stakeholder uh, consultation is extremely difficult, and I want to know if there are actual, actual recommendations out there. And also, how can we use these mechanisms, these human, human rights um, mechanism, human-centered approaches, to not to leave anyone behind? Because we are not talking about Afghanistan anymore. And um, like this is um, maybe, uh, so thank you so much for this session, uh, because I've been thinking about Sudan, uh, and I've been thinking about Afghanistan and uh, sanction, how sanctions affect them and how they're in crisis. But in this meeting, we need to talk more and more about them so that they won't be uh, forgotten. So uh, uh, thank you for the session, but also like the recommendations to uh, get in touch with the community and kind of address their needs as well. Um, uh, when we are doing the digital uh, developments and after that, dur during the crisis, uh, uh, that would be great. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. And I know uh, a lot of material has has been mentioned that, that will come out. And, and some of them, I think, also uh, focuses on, on stakeholder engagement. But uh, I think you're absolutely right. There is still uh, a lot more to, to be learned and, and, and improved. So, I mean, if anyone uh, has <laughs> anything in this sense to offer. Um, yes. Yeah, thank you for giving me a space uh, for I want to support Tatiana's words. And I think that international society should uh, do more pressure on global media platforms because they basically control what people think with their recommendation algorithms. Facebook actually can do a revolution in a click by altering the, like, the uh, news feed in some social accounts in some country. So that uh, we analyze that and we see that uh, global media platforms are extremely unsupported, uh, 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 say they're extremely against publishing their recommendation algorithms. And it was mentioned before that, that uh, some global media platforms take sides in the informational war happening all across the globe, and that's like some bad condition because they are tend they're, um, to be neutral because like there is no bad and good side. There's like side A and side B in every conflict. And uh, we see that global media platforms tend to take side to tend to alter recommendation algorithms uh, for the profit of one of the war sites but they are not doing it publicly, so they try to shadow it out. So they pretend to be non-biased and neutral, but they are not. So I think that the global society, and um, here supported Tiana for 100%, should uh, do more pressure on global media platforms uh, globally. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, yes, thank you very much. And I do think, uh, I mean, there have been long-standing calls around uh, more transparency when it comes to, to the recommender systems. Uh, we've had the uh, Digital Services Act just adopted in the EU. Let's see, uh, let's see if this uh, will bring improvement. Uh, and I know that El Elishka has uh, strong views on this as well. Uh, I mainly wanted to, uh, since Kapil has mentioned several resources, um, so, Together with Article 19, you are you kindly co-draft it, uh, and so did the Tiana actually the Joint Declaration of Principles on Content Governance and Platform Accountability in Times of Crisis. We did not manage to come up with a shorter um, title. Um, this is still a document that is available on our website. It's a um, joint effort of number of civil societies that have either first-hand experience with crisis or similarly to access now an Article 19, have global expertise in this area. And I think there are a number of 
even though it's a declaration, we still managed to put together 10 pages of relatively, at some instance, detailed rules for platform accountability. The declaration, why am I mentioning it? It's, it is specifically addressed to digital platforms that find themselves and operate in the situation of crisis. It has different recommendations for what should be done prior to escalation, during the escalation, and post-crisis, emphasizing correctly, as the speaker from GNI mentioned, that there is no clear end or starting point of any crisis. So there are a couple of detailed rules without going into the details. The document was launched at the, at the IJ last year, so it's already one year old. Um, but I think some important principles and rules can be found in there um, that can serve at least as a guiding light. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I've been I've been told to close. Uh, also, perhaps to say that uh, Article 19 is also working on two reports: one specific to propaganda for war and how it should be interpreted under the ICCPR, and the other one also trying to uh, identify um, and and address some some of these gaps um, that exist when it comes to the, the digital space and and armed conflicts. So, as you can tell, a lot more material is coming out. Uh, still not uh, enough quite yet, or it's just the start of a process. Um, so, uh, thank you to to our excellent speakers, Ruel, Tatiana, Katav, Elonai. Uh, thanks. It was a pleasure to have you, and thank you for everyone in in the room and and online who who participated and we will be speaking about this topic uh, for for years to come for sure thank you so much